everyone, my name is Arielle and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is all about the gear that I use to through hike the Pacific Crest Trail. But before we dive in, I just wanna say for any of you who are new to my channel, I did actually vlog my entire through hike. So I have about 24 episodes that <laughs> take you all the way from the Mexico-California border to the Washington-Canada border. And if that's something that interests you, then I'll just put the link somewhere on the top of the screen or in the description box below. Okay. Let's jump into today's video. So one of the main questions I've gotten about gear since I've gotten off trail is how did the gear I finished the trail with compare to the gear that I started the trail with? And I thought that the best way to answer this would be to watch through my original video with you guys about the gear that I was starting the trail with, which I can also put a link to somewhere on the screen if you wanna see that whole video, cause I'm just gonna show snippets of it here. And I will tell you what pieces of gear I kept, things that I changed or replaced, and then I'll make sure also to sneak in anything else that I added that wasn't mentioned in that video. So without further ado, let's watch. And I'm gonna start with my backpack. So I'm gonna be hiking with the Mountain Hardware PCT pack. It's, this is a 50 liter pack and it's the women's specific frame. Uh, okay, it's so funny watching this because the pack looks so clean. By the end of the trail, it was a completely different color. Um, but I did hike the entire trail with this pack and I loved it. Um, it's definitely not as lightweight as some of the other options out there on the market, but I actually really liked having a frame um, because kind of more often than not, I guess later in the trail, there were a lot of ways you could ha make your pack lighter. But early, early in the trail, we had heavy water, water carries. And then in the Sierra, you have like the bear canister, which is also pretty heavy and extra layers. And so I found that it was really nice to have a frame that actually um, helped distribute the weight. So even when my pack was fully loaded with food or fully loaded with water or whatever it might be, it actually sat really well on my body. So two thumbs up for me for this pack. I did the entire thing with it and I loved it the whole time. For my tent, I am going with the Mountain Hardware Nimbus two-person ultralight tent. Okay, so I also had this tent all the way to the end and again, really liked it. It was super lightweight. I really liked having the uh, double wall situation, meaning that there's a rain fly um, that's a separate piece versus a lot of the single wall tents where you don't really have the option to take the rain fly. It's like all included. So for me, this was really nice because on nice warm nights, you could take it off and you could like sleep under the stars without getting attacked by bugs. Cause that was a real problem in some of the sections. It was very buggy. Um, but you could also put the rain fly on if you wanted more privacy or if you wanted it to be a little bit warmer or anything like that. So I love this tent. It was also nice to have the two person because my husband did did hike the first hundred miles with me and we both fit in there. And then when he left, I felt like I had um, like a lot of space to myself and the weight difference between the one person and the two person to me kind of felt negligible. I'm not one of those people who's like super ultralight by any means. So it felt, it felt worth it to me to have the extra space. Okay. So for my sleeping bag, I have the mountain hardware phantom 15 degree bag. Okay. So similar to the last couple items, I did finish the trail start to finish with this bag. And uh, I think that's actually gonna be a trend for many of the things that I bring up in this video. But let me give you some feedback on how it went. I loved this bag, uh, especially on the cold nights. A 15 degree bag is not necessary for the entirety of the trail. And if you have the luxury to have different sleeping bags, um, then you could probably send yourself something that's a little bit um, warmer and or like lighter weight for warmer temperatures and might be lighter and packed down smaller for some of the middle part of the trail. Um, but for me, it just made the most sense to have one bag that could kind of fit the needs of the whole trail. So in the desert, there were a lot of nights that were below freezing or close to freezing and then in the Sierra and in northern Washington there were also some very cold nights where I was zipping the bag all the way up being fully bundled up with my hat and everything like that. The section in the middle like NorCal, Oregon, southern Washington I definitely didn't need a 15 degree bag and often slept with the bag fully unzipped but I kind of loved this like hack where I would take my sleep pad and shove it into the toe box like the bottom part of the sleeping bag but keep the rest of the sleeping bag unzipped and then I could kind of like wrap it around myself or lay it over myself kind of like similar to I think how someone would use a quilt but I just felt like that was so cozy and then I could sleep <laughs> in all of my interesting positions like I love to sleep with like my knee up in my armpit and things like that so it was actually kind of nice when I could sleep with the bag unzipped um, because I could sleep yeah like <laughs> 
like a mountain climber or a scarecrow or whatever. I don't know. You definitely find ways to get comfortable when you spend that many days sleeping on the ground. Okay, so before I dive into this pile of clothes here, I wanna start with what I'm physically wearing on my body. Uh, for socks, I have the Injinji toe socks. <laughs> okay, so yes, I did wear Injinji toe socks all the way to the end of the trail and I love them. Um, however, I went through so many pairs. It almost felt like I had to get a new pair every single resupply town that we were in because I kept blowing holes through the toes. And that is true for the thin versions or the thick versions. So there's, I know there's multiple like thicknesses of multiple styles and thicknesses. And believe you me, I've I tried every single style and thickness of the low cut versions or like the mids that are like ankle height. And I still blew through the toes. Um, so I don't know. My best solution was just to have two pairs at a time and to, you know, swap them out when they really started to get like super grimy because that seemed like it made them more abrasive. But honestly, there were some pairs where I blew a hole through the toe within like one day of hiking. So I have mixed feelings because I love them and I didn't get a single toe blister on the entire trail, but I did find... Um, that I really went through them. Whereas people who were hiking with like, let's say darn tufts, um, they didn't have as many sock blowouts as I did. On top, I have the mountain hardware, I think it's called the Crater Lake Sun Hoodie. Okay, so I hiked the entire desert section of the trail in the Crater Lake Sun Hoodie and it was really wonderful. It was nice to have a hood um, to, keep my hat on and also like cover my ears when there's a lot of like there's a lot of just exposure in the desert where there's not a lot of shade coverage and so having that extra sun protection was really helpful and then I also liked having the long sleeves that came all the way up over my hands and it had like a thumb hole so it like covered even up to my knuckles and um the fact that it was white was good because it kept like it kept me as cool as possible. I mean, wearing a full length long sleeve um, hooded shirt in the desert on some of those days was pretty hot. But in some ways it was almost lighter or like cooler than it would be to have my skin out because I wasn't getting sunburned or anything like that because it has UPF in it. And the only downside of the white was <laughs> it was incredibly dirty by the end and there was nothing I could do to make it look clean again. But um, honestly, pretty much everything that you have ends up kind of being like that. So yeah, it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't unexpected. I had two different other hiking shirts that I ended up wearing on the trail. One of them, let me grab it real quick. It was this shirt called the Canyon Long Sleeve. And again, it has UPF in it, but it's like a button up so I could like button it down when it was getting hot. I wore this through the whole Sierra section and into Northern California. And then my favorite shirt that I started wearing in Northern California and wore to the end was this guy, which I think is called the Shade Light. I'll put it down in the description below, but I love the fact that it is like fun and festive. I feel like Hawaiian shirts are kind of the fun part of the PCT trail culture, but it's actually a hiking shirt. So it's really lightweight. It dries incredibly fast and it has UPF in it. So this was like, you know, this was like my favorite piece of gear, I think, from the entire trail. And I ended up getting myself, you can see how clean and fresh this one is. Uh, I ended up getting myself a fresh one for after trail because similar to the white shirt, my other one was, you know, a little bit dirty and brown after hiking. And then on the bottom, I have these mountain hardware hiking shorts. Okay, so I hiked, I actually changed the shorts, but they are also a different pair, just a different pair of mountain hardware black hiking shorts. So again, I'll just put the name in the description box below. First, I have this wind shirt also from mountain hardware okay so same thing with the wind shirt i did carry it all the way to the end i would say that this is one item that it's like the days that i used it i really loved it and i was really grateful to have it but it was probably my least used article of clothing i kept it because it weighs like basically nothing in it bundles up into a ball like this big. But if I was going to get rid of one of the layers that I brought, this might be the one. I don't know though. It's just like, it was, like I said, on the mornings that, um, that I used it. It was really nice, especially when I changed to the short sleeve shirt. It was nice to have a really thin, lightweight, um, long sleeve just in case. But yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of like this on that layer. I did love it and it did make it all the way to the end. But if I had to cut something out, this would probably be the layer that I used the least. 
Then we move forward into this fleecy layer. This is actually probably a, quite a bit more lightweight than it looks on the screen. This is the Mountain Hardware Air Mesh Hoodie. This thing is wonderful. It kind of is like a similar look as a Melanzana, which are very popular out there on the trail, but it's much thinner and lighter. And so for a lot of people, they carried a Melanzana, but for me, instead I had this layer and that wind shirt that I just showed you as kind of like in the end, those made it like take up about the same amount of weight and space as someone who had a Melly. Um, but I loved this. It was incredibly lightweight. I didn't really ever hike in it, but I slept in it every single night. The only days that I ended up hiking in it were like the super, super, super cold days where we were like, like I think Mount Whitney and, um, and maybe like, Goats Rocks Wilderness on the Knife Edge. Other than that, it was a layer that I reserved mostly for sleeping, um, but it was very cozy for sleeping and I'm super glad I had it. My puppy layer is the Ghost Whisperer Ultralight from Mountain Hardware and it is... <laughs> Again, it's so funny looking at this and seeing how like clean it looks. Like even after washing it and drying it and fluffing it again, um, it does not look like this anymore. I still like it. Like I don't mind if my gear looks worn because it is worn. It means it's used and it's loved, but it looks so shiny and fresh in this. Um, this jacket was great. This was a really popular jacket out on the trail. It's definitely not the only person that had this. It comes in men's and women's and it's like a thousand fill, but it literally like packs down to the tiniest little ball and it weighs like next to nothing. It's super lightweight. And I did find that it was plenty warm, especially with some of the other layers layered underneath and the rain jacket over if I really needed to. But most of the time, um, this jacket lived in the outside pocket of my backpack so that anytime we were like stopping in the shade for a break or anything like that, like even on warm days, sometimes um, when you'd stop in the shade, it was just nice to have something to throw on real quickly. So I um, use this till the end and loved it and highly recommend. For my rain layer, I have the Mountain Hardware Exposure 2, which is actually Gore-Tex and it's like fully tape scenes, fully waterproof, and it is by far the lightest rain jacket I have ever felt or used or worn. Yeah, uh, still would agree with that. <laughs> it is so lightweight, uh, but it definitely did the job. Um, I didn't use my rain jacket all that much, but I feel like it's a layer that you definitely have to have. We had rain once in the desert we had a couple of colder days like uh, Mount Whitney I had every single layer I owned on and then there were a couple of colder days in Sierra I'm trying to think if it even rained I think that it really didn't rain much until in Washington especially the last week it rained a lot so I used my rain jacket pretty much every day and uh, it definitely was fully waterproof I'm still pretty impressed with how lightweight and small and packable it's able to be and still be fully waterproof so again this was another really awesome layer and even though it didn't get used as much as some other pieces of gear having a rain jacket especially when you when like your other layers are down or you know whatever it's just kind of essential um to make sure that you can stay dry um, I do have a couple extra little things, like I have one extra pair of hiking socks, so I can always have dry socks. I have a pair of sleep socks, so super cozy and warm. I really like sleeping in some cozier socks and having like dry, clean <laughs> socks to put on at the end of the day. And then I have just a little beanie. Uh <laughs> okay, so um, the sleep sock situation. Okay, so I, for probably a thousand miles every night would wipe down my feet and put on my sleep sleep socks um but eventually I stopped doing that and got kind of lazy and so the idea of having sleep socks well okay here's where it all went downhill one of the times that I blew through the toe toes of one of my Njinjis I was forced to wear my sleep socks as hiking socks and they are less durable they're kind of they were like a lighter weight version and they did not last. So I got a hole in them and then I had to throw them away. So then I had this like, do I, don't I of having other sleep socks and I decided on the don't I. So I'm sorry if this sounds really gross, but I can assure you <laughs> there are much grosser things out there on the trail. I honestly would have two pairs of socks and I would wear one pair until it was like halfway through that stretch. And then I would just change to the other pair and I would just wipe my feet down that one time, honestly, 
I didn't even take my socks off at night once I started this situation. So yeah, but at this point I will say I didn't have blisters or anything like that. So in the beginning of the trail, when you're dealing with blisters and that sort of stuff, you kind of have to keep your feet a lot cleaner, but towards the end, it doesn't matter so much. And yeah, you kind of become gross. So this is, um, a pillow from Nemo Equipment. Yeah, the sleep pillow. So this is obviously like, it's not the smallest or lightest pillow option, but I um, I tried to change to a Sea to Summit pillow somewhere in, you know, in actually in SoCal, like after like the first three or 400 miles, because I saw everyone else's was like so tiny and little. And I did one stretch with it like you know one five six day stretch with it and hated it I just thought it was so uncomfortable I think the pillow situation really depends on how you sleep you know so for the people who can sleep on their back with their you know arms along their side and whatever like the sea to summit ones seem to work okay because there's just not any side I I sleep on my belly or like on my side I'm always rolling all around and so and I also like to like put my arm underneath it and so I just kind of needed like a more a flat more squishy pillow that had a bigger surface area and yeah so I ended up going immediately back to my Nemo pillow and I used it all the way to the end and absolutely loved it. Um, this is my sleeping pad it's the Neo Air but it's the short version so it only that's a no for me couldn't do the short version. I used it for the 100 miles that Sam was with me and then he was using my Nemo sleep pad um, that I brought on the Tahoe Rim Trail. And as soon as he left, I commandeered the Nemo one. <laughs> And it was so much more comfortable, definitely worth the extra weight for me. However, um, that pad did end up popping and in, yeah, like in the northern part of the desert. And I did replace it with the kind of longer, the full length women's Neo Air. And that was fine. I still like, I slept great and I found, you know, like I said, my system of putting the sleep pad into my sleeping bag, like in the bottom and could get really comfortable. Um, but I kind of like the sleep pads that have more surface area. I don't know. Like, like I said, I'm not like necessarily worried about being the most ultra light I possibly can. Like it's sometimes to me feels worth it to have a couple extra ounces here and there for things that are going to make you more comfortable, especially for such a long stretch. I know that there are people who would definitely disagree with me and that is totally fine. That's why you just got to do your own thing. But personally, I think, yeah, it's nice to have a little a little extra um, in the comfort department so you can get good sleep and everything like that. So I think that the longer women's Neo Air totally worked for me and I will keep using that until one day it pops because that's kind of like, uh, it just will happen, unfortunately. They just only last so long. But I may consider going back to the Nemo one because it's a little bit wider and I like having the extra surface area. I have this very small camp towel. This did not make it to the end. It did make it pretty far though. I don't think I ended up getting rid of this until even like Oregon. I think I kept justifying having it because it was so small. But in the end, I decided to, um, I actually don't know if I showed it in this. I have a buff, like a really thin buff. And so at the time I was, for most of the trail, I was carrying the thin buff and I was carrying the camp towel, the small camp towel. And I just decided that the buff could be used as a camp towel, but also as a buff. And so I'd rather have the multi-function of that. So I sent the camp towel home. And then last but not least in this bag, I have my bug net. <laughs> yes, the bug net was so essential. Um, I carried it the whole trail, but I probably could have sent it to myself in Kennedy Meadow South, like starting with the Sierra North, um, because there really weren't mosquito type bugs in the desert. It, it was, there were bugs around, but just not that really like that, that kind. Um, but I used the bug net every day in the Sierra, <laughs> a lot of days in Oregon and a lot of days in Washington. So that was essential. And something else I found really helpful for the bugs were my rain pants, um, which I don't know if I mentioned in this video, but I had rain pants sent to myself in the Sierra and um, I used them much more for bugs than for anything else. We had like only a little bit, we had rain one day in the Sierra and it was not enough to warrant wearing pants, but I did have the pants for, um, summoning Whitney to having that extra wind layer was essential it was so cold up there before sunrise and then um yeah like I said I used the rain <laughs> the rain pants for pucks um I did not keep the rain pants with me until the end there were definitely moments when it was really buggy in Oregon that I kind of wish that I had them but I just 
did my best got by. Um, something else I didn't mention in this video was sweatpants. I wore these like um, kind of thinner sweatpants at night and um, those were the reason I liked had sweatpants instead of like a thermal pant was that I could put them over my shorts. So if it was cold in the morning, I could hike with them over my shorts and then take them off. Um, yeah, like take the, take them off without having to take all of my clothes off and I could like even fit them over my shoes. Um, I would say that was kind of like more of a luxury item for me in the sense that it was not the lightest and smallest option I possibly could have had, but I did wear them every single night to sleep um, except a, like a handful of really, really hot nights in Northern California and Southern Oregon. Um, but yeah, to each his own on that, but I did really enjoy having the sweatpant option and um yeah, those I carried from the beginning to the end. For my cook system, I have the jet boil. I think it's called the Minimo. It's like the smaller one. And then I store my um, little bit of fuel in there. Um, okay, so if you watched my, I did a mid trail, like a update video right before the Sierra of gear I had changed. And I talked about this in there, but I did not end up using this stove all the way to the end. I got um, the Jet Boil, like their ultralight stove, their version of an ultralight stove. So it doesn't have that like, kind of like black sleeve on it. Um, I think I bought it in Big Bear. It was like almost half the weight of that and it was a different shape. It's like a little bit flatter and like more stout, which I felt was a little bit easier to, um, to pack. And obviously it was lighter. And honestly too, for the, for the cooking and boil time, I felt like it was just as fast. So I do like the regular jet boils, but the, I'll put the name of it on the screen, the lightweight version. I can't remember what it is right now, but I really, really, really like this lightweight version. And I'll probably not end up going back to the other one because this one is lighter and I swear it boils just as fast. This is also something I brought on the Tahoe Rim Trail. It's the GSI Outdoors like ultralight mug. It literally weighs nothing. This bad boy made it to the end again. Um, <laughs> It is not that same color, that's for sure, especially because I had it clipped onto the outside of my pack, so it was really weathered. This is another one of those items that you probably could get by without, like I probably could have got by without it um, because you can use your stove, but it was nice to not have to clean my stove in between all of the things. And if I wanted to have like a tea and a hot meal, I could do them at the exact same time. And then I also made, I was using this like um, greens powder for a lot of the, for the whole trail. And I um, would use that uh, the GSI mug like a shaker bottle and so uh, it was nice to have a lid that like fully sealed off so for me this was really nice and because it's just so easy and clips onto the outside it's not very cumbersome but yeah having an extra mug is not necessarily I would say you could totally get by without it but if you like having that luxury this is a really nice option because it is super light Okay, so first and foremost, I have a Nightcore power bank. I am not 100% sure the exact model, but again, I'll put it in the description box below for those of you guys who wanna know all the details. It is a 200,000 amp hour. <laughs> Uh, 20,000 and I think it's milliamp hour or milliamps, something like that. Anyways, regardless, this is the, um, this is the power bank that I used until the end of the trail and I loved it. Um, one of the, like a couple of the pluses, it's really lightweight for how much like output it has and it, um, it actually recharges itself pretty quickly. So one of the issues you might uh, run into with other power banks is they may charge your stuff really quickly, but they may take like 10 hours themselves to charge. And if you're only doing a Nero and you have to charge something like charge your power bank, literally in the time where you're just sitting around in town, you want things to be able to charge faster than that. So I think this thing recharges in like five or six hours. Um, so you could just like literally plug it in and go like when you get into town and then go do all your stuff and come back and it will be either fully charged or close to fully charged, which is super nice. Um, my GoPro and the Garmin um, that I'll show you in a minute both use the same cord. So I have a cord for that. Um, I have a cord to charge the um, power bank itself. And then I have my iPhone cord. Okay, so I the Garmin and the power bank and the GoPro all actually use the same cord. Um, 
but having two was nice because um, I'll show you in a second the wall charger that I use and I could charge two things at a time. Um, so a lot of times like I would charge my phone and the Garmin and then I would come back later and you know charge the power bank and my GoPro and that allowed me to always have two things charging at one time. And then I do have a like a quick charge wall charger. This will also be really um, like a big determinant about how fast your like power bank and your phone and these things will charge when you're in town. So I got one that has the fastest capacity. The bottom um, piece is what I'll charge, the smaller one, um, I think it's USB-C, is what I'll charge my uh, power bank off of. And then the upper one, that's like a USB. Okay, so like I said, I had the two black cords with the USB USB-C outlet at the end. Um, one of them was USB-C to USB-C, so that one would go in that bottom um, hole, and the top one was USB-C to USB. <laughs> and so that way I could always have two things charging at the same time, like I said before. So that was a really nice option, and um, obviously I'm I'm pretty sure you guys, you tech people out there can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure USB-C is a faster charging port. So if you can get all of your cords to be USB-C and then get a wall charger that's all USB-C, that's a really nice way also to charge all your stuff a lot faster. And then I did bring a, a, a dock so I can charge two GoPro batteries at a time. This is something that I'll see if it's necessary. I brought it all the way to the end. I did end up using it. Um, like I said, there's just times where you're in town for like not all that long, like when you're not taking full zeros. And so to be able to charge two batteries at once was really helpful. I found that when I was vlogging um, like actively, I would use about one GoPro battery a day. Um, there were some sections where like I would blow through batteries like the Sierra. I think I just every little thing was ma was magical and I wanted to film all of it. And so I would blow through batteries super quickly there and end up having to recharge them more often. Uh, but then there were other sections of trail where we were kind of just head down hiking and it was, don't get me wrong, still beautiful, but just maybe not as like, you know, like not every little view that you saw was just like dramatic and different. So in those sections, the GoPro batteries lasted a little longer, but I'd say, yeah, on average, my GoPro batteries were lasting about one day of vlogging. And so I uh, definitely needed the dock to the end to be able to really maximize my recharge time. With that, I have four in total um, because there's one in my GoPro, uh, these Enduro batteries. Yeah, I feel like this was really helpful. So having the recharge, like having the power bank was great, but when you are recharging your you know, GoPro batteries and your phone pretty much every day and anything else that you might have to recharge. Um, it, I would say the power bank is, can be limited. So for me, I found, especially when we'd have a long stretch, let's say it was six full days, it was really nice to leave town with my Garmin charged, my phone charged, four batteries charged and the power bank charged. And I would still, I would have enough juice in my power bank to make it to the end, but barely. Um, obviously on shorter stretches, having three GoPro or having four GoPro batteries in total was probably not necessary, but there was enough of the trail where it was really necessary because for some reason the GoPro battery kind of drains quite a bit of juice from the power bank especially compared to like let's say my phone so yeah I found um I found that that was really helpful and they are pretty small and light so um it was good and this is not one of the enduro batteries I'm just sitting at my desk and uh have this here but the enduro batteries make a world of difference if you are in hot or cold temperatures um so if you're someone who's planning on vlogging with a GoPro whether that's on the trail or anything else that you do um I highly recommend having the Enduro battery if you're gonna be out in variable temperature settings. So here I have my med kit. So I have things like, you know, gloves in here, like a kind of like triangular bandage, um, regular band-aids. I have um, this doTERRA Correct X, which is basically like a natural version of Neosporin. Um, and then like a couple of like little, you know, medicine type things like some ibuprofen, some like tummy stuff and, um, I also have some backup water purification powder just in case my filter will were to fail. I hope it doesn't because it's very chlorine-y tasting and I really don't want to drink it, but you know, just in case. This was one of the places where Nika actually had some suggestions for me to add in some things like some 
Luco tape, I think it's called, and KT tape. <laughs> this is funny for me. Okay, so it's like, I think it's called Luco tape. Believe me, you will know the name of Luco tape very quickly on the PCT because it is essential for the world of blisters. Um, in a perfect world, you put Luco tape on when you're getting a hot spot and it prevents you from getting a blister. And I kid you not, all of us had feet just covered in Luco tape um, for the first couple hundred miles. So it is a really good friend of yours. <laughs> and I highly recommend you have it and have a roll of it somewhere. Um, you know, some people had it wrapped around their pole or things like that which it kind of gets stuck and sticky, but if you're using it regularly, that is a good option. Um, and then KT tape. Um, also, if you get any sort of musculoskeletal um, thing, like I had my hip flexor strain, Luco tape was really helpful. I also used it for my knees in the beginning when I was having knee issues. And yeah, I'd say pretty much everyone I know used Luco tape, or excuse me, Everyone uses Luco tape, but pretty much everyone I know also use KT tape at one point in another because it's kind of hard to avoid, um, completely avoid overuse injuries when you're out there pushing yourself so hard. And then this is my toiletry kit. Um, I had transferred some of my favorite products into little lip gloss tubes and I put these in my resupplies. So they're super lightweight and I really only have what I need. I have a face wash. I have like a hydrating serum. So like if I get really windburned or any of those things or sunburn, I have something to help with my skin. And then I have, this is actually just Dr. Bronner's diluted. Um, I have this little face scrubber. It's very light, just a little silicone thing. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if something, I don't know if it would interest you guys. I feel like this is something I was going to do more in the personal Q and a is do like my full skincare routine, how I actually did my skincare routine on the trail. So if that's something that interests you, put it down in the description box below, but I did keep all of these products till the end. And I did love that little face scrubber. It was awesome. So normally when I'm backpacking, I just bring a little bit of baby wipes, which has been really great. But I was recently turned on to these things called Porter Wipes. Porter Wipes are far superior to baby wipes. Um, you can't change my mind now. I Now that I've done the whole trail with Porter Wipes, I'm just obsessed. They are like these little, almost like coin sized things, very light. And they actually, you add water to them and they open up into very similar to a baby wipe, but they're hypoallergenic. They don't have like anything added, um, biodegradable and all that, but I will still 100% be packing these out. Definitely always leave no trace. I have some bug spray, the doTERRA Terra Shield. So again, just like a more natural art alternative to DEET and things like that. I opted for these um, on, gu on guard, like doTERRA on guard travel toothpaste. They're like, it's just natural toothpaste and they come in these little tubes. Um, during the day, I'm just gonna use like a moisturizer with sunscreen. I also have like a really small uh, body sunscreen here. I tend to not burn once I have a good base tan, but I will for sure use sunscreen through the desert. And if I'm being totally honest with you, after that, I probably will only use this on my face because I don't really burn after that. Okay, so yeah, all of this checks out still. I, um, that bug stuff was great. I personally found that it worked well for me. Um, there were some people that felt like they could, like DEET was the only option for them. So I feel like to each his own, you know, work with whatever works best for you. I like this option because it's, um, you know, more natural and less chemical. Um, but yeah, that was great. The toothpaste worked out great, but obviously like you can just get travel toothpaste at any grocery store you go to. So that's an easy fix. And um, <laughs> I was right, like for myself, that that's what happened. I used sunscreen. I don't even know if I used sunscreen the entire desert because I had a long sleeve shirt for most of the desert. So I was only putting sunscreen on my legs. And I mean, obviously I have the face sunscreen, which I did use till the end. Um, I always use sunscreen on my face, but yeah, I don't know. Once my legs have a tan, like it just kind of felt like a waste. And honestly, like a lot of times you're so dirty anyways. Um, but I am, <laughs> I'm not the only, I mean, I'm, other people are not always able to do that. There was, um, my friend Stinger was much more fair skinned <laughs> and she for sure 100% had to put sunscreen on every single day for the entire trail. So, um, know yourself, take care of yourself. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel fortunate that I at least, um, was able to take that one thing off the list later in the trail because yeah, didn't end up burning once I had that little base tan going. I also have earplugs. Can confirm that earplugs were essential and getting ones that are comfortable. A lot of people, um, 
complained that they couldn't wear earplugs because they were uncomfortable. And when I gave them my pair that it's like flat on both sides, I just found them on like Amazon, just like sleeping earplugs. Um, they were a lot more comfortable. I slept with them basically every single night. It's nice for like a handful of reasons. Um, a lot of times, you know, obviously there are like the sounds of nature that might wake you up, but it's, you know, like a lot of the camp areas, um, you're not alone or if you're with your tramily, you're not alone. So you can kind of like block out all the sounds of people like sliding around on their <laughs> sleep pads because um, that can get kind of loud and crinkly sounding. Or also like <laughs> so, some of the places in town would be like near trains. And so just to like have something to like block out the sound. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of earplugs and I yeah, I use them till the end. So I highly recommend if you're like a lighter sleeper to find some earplugs that work well for you. I have my toothbrush and I did chop the end off of it, but it wasn't for weight. It was so that it would fit better in my Ziploc bag because otherwise it's kind of awkward. So I did cut it so that it actually fits sideways in my bag. This will obviously have to be replaced a couple of times throughout the trail, but this is the one I'm starting with. So I also have some biodegradable flossers in here. Again, I have just as many as I need and I have all my resupply boxes set up to have like the perfect amount. Yep, that checks out. So this is my food bag. This is three days worth of food. And this is, I think it's Z-Packs, um, one of their like ultralight roll top um, bags, which I'm super excited about. And then this is kind of gonna be my eating vessel. Um. <laughs> Okay, so food bag, I did use that um, blue food bag for the entire desert. And then in the Sierra, I moved to a bear canister because you need a bear canister for that section. And then after the Sierra, I actually ha sent myself my Ursac and Ursac is a bear proof bag. And it's definitely heavier than that like blue food bag that I used in the beginning. But um, you do go through other sections of the trail that have a lot of bear activity, um, specifically desolation wilderness. And I, I actually think that there's a part of Desolation Wilderness that now requires bear cans. You may be able to hike through that section in one day and so you wouldn't need it, but there's just bears around. And so um, I liked having the Ursac. I um, was good about using it like how it's intended to be used, like tying it off away from me um, in the sections where there were bears. But later on in the trail, when we were in sections that weren't really um, bear heavy, I didn't end up, I would use, I still had the Ursac because it didn't, it seemed like a waste to like keep swapping it in and out, but I would just use it like a normal food bag because pretty much, you know, everyone around me had, had their food in their tent also anyways. And we never had any issues with bears. Um, anywhere on the trail but I did hear stories from desolation wilderness and um you know places like that that people did have some curious critters so it's really important to do you know follow the rules in whatever area and be bear aware and then the silicone bag it was such a great intention and I did it for the entire desert um but in the Sierra I felt like everything, like speaking of bears, everything that had a scent needed to be put into my bear can. And so instead of having that like kind of bigger bag, because my bear can was full to the brim on, on the beginning of those six day stretches, I started doing the thing where I just cook in the Ziploc because then when it's done, it packs down to basically nothing. And I had all the intention of um, getting my stasher bag back at some point, but I just kind of got in the groove with the Ziplocs. Um, and then I have my super long spoon, um, which is really nice because um, you don't have to get your hands all uh, like foodie to get to the bottom of your bag when you're eating. Super long spoons are the best. Um, starting with my toiletry kit here. Um, this is like the actual bathroom kit, I guess I should say, instead of toiletry kit. So this has like my ultralight poop shovel. It has like, I have this little travel bidet. I just um, kind of feel like it's a little bit cleaner. That way I have more of those porta wipes. Um, I have the doTERRA on guard, like sanitizing mist, which is basically like a hand sanitizer. It's got, you know, alcohol in it. Um, and then a, like another Ziploc baggie in there for the wipes when I am done. Okay, I'm sorry if this is TMI, but that little travel bidet. So there's a couple different travel bidet options. One, mine was like, it's like its own little vessel. You put like a little bit of water. I think it holds like two ounces of water. So you put a little water in and then you can squeeze it and it sprays. Another option people have is one that's like screws onto the top of the smart water bottle. For me, the smart bottle one sounds just really gross. I don't want the water bottle I'm drinking out of anywhere near my butt, but that's just me personally. I, I have no judgment if that's you and you love that. And then this little one, is great 
when you can sit on a toilet, but for some reason, the angle when you are in full squat, I just like could not master it. So unfortunately that didn't work out super well and I just ended up using um, porta wipes instead anyways. Okay, so for my water system, I'm going with the Sawyer system here and I have the Sawyer Mini. Okay, so the Sawyer Mini um, did not last very long. What I go on to say in this video is that Nika recommended that I may end up wanting to switch to the normal Sawyer just because the flow rate is so much faster. And she was right. I um, very quickly switched to the full size Sawyer. And uh, in theory, the Sawyer should be able to do enough gallons of water that you could use one Sawyer for the entire trail. But I don't know. I found that even with um, back flushing and everything that for the Sawyer after a certain point, it would just get really like the flow rate would get really slow. So pretty much everyone I was hiking with did replace replace their Sawyer at least once on trail. Um, but again, maybe, you know, maybe if you're just really, really adamant about back flushing, you can keep that flow rate. But definitely Sawyer Squeeze over Sawyer Mini, it's worth the like marginally, you know, marginally extra amount of weight that it costs or that it weighs. I also have um, two two liter sea knock bags which i can filter out of the bottom and uh, for the desert section this will allow me to carry six liters of water all at once if needed <laughs> so i think that they're actually pronounced just knock like the sea is silent but pretty much everyone on trail still calls them sea knock bags and it is by far like the most popular system out there on trail it's not a foolproof system um i did have the two of them for the desert and I did use my six close uh, five liters not usually six but at least five liters um a, a handful of times in the desert for some of those long carries um but after that I just would bring one of these bags with me and so I sent the other one home um but eventually I had to have it sent back to me because these bags kind of notoriously split at the seams so something that I didn't have originally that I would include here is some sort of repair kit or patch kit because almost everyone I know had like their C knock split at a seam. And so um, there's the, I think it's called tenacious tape or something like that, where you, it's like a really like high quality kind of sealant tape. That and a small thing is super glue was a really helpful thing to have for um, fixing any holes on these. And I literally, I had a seam split and I put super glue and tenacious tape and it worked with were worked till you know till the end of the trail um so they are repairable but it is something that you'll need to have in your kit the tenacious tape is also really great um, if you have like a sleeping pad pop or anything like that when i had my nemo pad pop it was in the middle of a section and um so i repaired it with tenacious tape until i was able to do a full replacement on that so super helpful to keep that in your kit this looks a little clunky, but it's actually very lightweight. This is a mini tripod setup for my phone. Which I'm gonna stop myself right there because I think I go on and explain how cool this like little tripod phone thing is. And I didn't use it once. I carried it for 100 miles and then realized that I just really wasn't setting up shots on my phone. I do have like a, the, for my GoPro. So I brought my GoPro and my phone as like my filming devices and I, um, love the combo because I do think the phone sometimes has a better it's like better at showing scale the GoPro often it's like a bit more wide angle even when it's on narrow so it make, can make the mountains look really small um, however I just found that if I ever needed to have anything set up on the tripod I would just use the GoPro so like I would uh, my GoPro has a selfie stick it's called the three-way arm I think and it's definitely not the lightest option but it gives me a lot of versatility of how I can set the GoPro up um yeah I mean I think that I totally could have found ways to use the tripod for the phone but in the end I think it's just too redundant so it's better to just have like bring one tripod and just choose whatever device you're going to film all those on. And I most, the only time I really set up the GoPro on the tripod was to film time lapses and those I would always film on the GoPro anyways. So anyways, this didn't end up making it. This thing was one of the few things that went very, very quickly and was never used. Of course I have a headlamp. Okay. So, um, 
I did change my headlamp. I started with like a headlamp that has batteries because I thought that that made the most sense. But there's a Nightcore headlamp that's rechargeable and it is like a fraction of the weight. It's so much lighter and the charge lasts for so long. Like I wouldn't, if I left town with it charged, I would not need to charge it again. Um, oftentimes for like weeks on end, especially when you're not using it all that much at night. Um, but it would for sure last an entire, you know, three to six day stretch. So I um, I do highly recommend the Nightcore rechargeable headlamp because I thought it was really awesome. Super excited about this. I got the new InReach Mini 2. Yes, yeah, so this actually made a big difference, especially, you know, with how much juice you get out of your power bank. So if I, with the InReach Mini 2, the new one, I could go an entire stretch again, five, six days and um, not have to charge it. Whereas the original InReach Mini, you would have to charge like every three days. So it can be quite a draw on your power bank. Um, like I said, it is lighter. Uh, one thing I will say though, is I don't really keep, I don't keep tracking on my Garmin. I just send, um, I would just send a like a waypoint uh, each night. And so the more tracking you have going on your Garmin, whether it's the new one or the older one, um, the quicker you'll go through the battery. So I would say, especially if you plan on having tracking going, you definitely want the new one because you will burn through that um, the battery really quick on the old Garmin InReach Mini. Um, but even if you don't, it was really, really nice not to have to worry about um, charging it on the trail and just only having that be something I worried about in town. I probably should have showed you this when I showed you my bathroom kit, but this is my Kula cloth. Um, it's just like an antimicrobial cloth um, for peeing. Highly recommend these if you are a lady out there on the trail. These are wonderful. For sunglasses, I have just like, I wear these on all these all the adventures. If you watch my videos before, you've seen these a million times. I just have my Oakley Latch sunglasses. Also these guys. That, that pair that you are seeing in this video made it all the way to the end of the trail and I still have them. They are a little bit scratched, um, so I think I need to get new lenses for them. But I was very impressed because I feel like I am the queen of losing sunglasses and somehow this pair made it all the way to the end. Isn't that crazy? So in the hip belt of my backpack, I have a couple of things. I have um, Burt's Bees is my favorite chapstick. The only downside is it doesn't have SPF. So this will be more like for nighttime. And then during the day, I would use this uh, Super Goop um, chapstick that has SPF 30 in it. I also have some Arnica, which is like a natural um, pain reliever type. I don't even know what you would call this, like uh, homeopathic type medicine and then a lighter. Okay, so um, the chapsticks, those were the same chapsticks I used until the end. I um, I think I had to replace the Burt's Bee at one point and the sunscreen chapstick, I really didn't end up using all that much towards the end, but it was really, really essential in the desert. The Arnica, um, you know, it's hard to say if it made much of a difference. I didn't use ibuprofen until I got injured. I think I had taken literally four tablets of ibuprofen um, from the entire trail until mid Oregon. And all of those times were for like a headache. Um, so I tried not to take ibuprofen for like body, for like, you know, if I was sore or anything like that, the only thing I really ended up caving for was was a bad headache. Um, so it's hard to say if the Arnica really helped or not, but I, you know, was able to make it through the beginning of the trail without loading up on ibuprofen, which is nice. But when I ran out of that tube of Arnica tablets, I didn't end up replacing it. And I did switch my lighter to just be in my um, cook set because that's really the only time that I used it. I also have some headphones that have like a regular phone jack and have a cord so I don't have to worry about charging them. Ugh. Um, I did use those headphones all the way to the end but they're so annoying and I honestly think it may have been worth it to just do the wireless and charge them. Um, yeah, some people did have the wireless ones and I was so jealous because my cords were always getting tangled up in all the things. So I don't know, make the right decision for you. But I think that in the future, I'm just going to bring my wireless ones because the cords were super annoying. It's very small, lightweight, little Gerber knife. Um, this is like the miniature version of the one that I usually hike with. Um, I, You could get by without a knife. The only time I used my knife really was to um, slice salami. And later on in the trail, I often would just like 
pre-sliced, buy pre-sliced salami or, or pre-sliced cheese or do that like ahead of time and then just put it in Ziplocs. So um, yeah, I didn't use the knife all that much. It's so small that it wasn't like really a burden to carry, but I wouldn't say that it's like the most essential thing. I also have a sip pad. So this is just like a super small ultralight sip pad from z -Packs. I hated that thing. <laughs> It's just too small for me, you know? Maybe I'm just a little bit more bougie, but I just, I, especially in the desert, like it wasn't, you couldn't like, um, it wasn't big enough to like stretch on and that just was so essential. So that thing did not last very long. I'm pretty sure either in, in Julian or, well, I don't know, one of the early towns, maybe Idlewild, I ended up buying one of those, like the normal size fold pads with spice. And then we cut it so that we each got half of it. So it was like, you know, it would be like from your, your head to your hips. So not enough for a sleep pad, but like way better for a sit pad. Um, but it was still a little bit big and kind of clunky. And one of the days on trail, if you watch my mid, like my, um, my gear video from the middle of the trail, you already hear that, or you already know that I swapped it one more time to one of those one eighth foam pads. Um, I didn't actually tell you guys the story though. I found that on the trail. So it was like wrapped around, it was coming down. It was a really horrible day where you go down like 1300 feet and then right back up 1300 feet, like pretty steep. And um, it was like wrapped around a tree. So it must have like blown off somebody's bag. And I had been wanting one of these for so long, but the Gossamer gear ones, which were the only ones I knew about at the time were always sold out. And so I wasn't able to get one before the trail. The reason they're so great is because they're so thin and they're so light that it's like basically just as light as that stupid little sit pad that I just showed you but you can put it underneath your sleep pad at night and like protect your sleep pad from like little obstructions and it's also great for just stretching most of the time you sit on it folded up once or twice because it's very very thin um, but I'd wanted one for forever and I literally found it on the trail like wrapped around a tree it must have blown off someone's bag and so I grabbed it of course you know and didn't want to leave it there anyways and I asked every single person that we um, met until town so I probably asked like 20 or 30 different hikers and nobody knew who's mad it was so in town I cleaned it as my own and I swapped it out um you know the trail provides and I ended up passing along my other sit pad to somebody else who wanted more of a sit pad so it was like a nice kind of like <laughs> giving situation but I love the one eighth one eighth foam uh, mats and there are other companies that make them uh, I think Laurel Mountain Designs is another company um, that makes them that is that was not sold out when we were on trail so I don't actually know where mine what brand mine was because it doesn't say on the pad um, but I know Gossamer Gear makes one and Laurel Mountain Designs I think is the name the shoes I'm hiking with as you can tell, they have been recently worn. These are the Brooks Cascadia, and I have my custom orthotics inside. Um, I do have like a point on my feet where my bones kind of push together, and so I got orthotics made that like push up there and spread my bones out. That was just the only issue I had with my feet on the Tahoe Rim Trail. And then I have my Dirty Girl Gators just to keep things like, you know, out of the shoes, like dust and sand and, you know, um, like little rocks and things like that. Um, yeah, this combo was excellent for me. I went through six pairs of shoes and, um, I actually blew holes in the gaiters. So I don't know something about my stride. I must kick the inside of my foot. And so I did end up having to replace the gaiters too at some point, but that, um, that's not uncommon. Uh, definitely, I was not the only one that was getting holes in their gaiters. And um, the Dirty Girl gaiters were super popular out there on trail. The nice thing about Brooks and Ultras, if those work for you, is that they have the Velcro for the gaiter already like in the shoe. Whereas if you got something like Hoka's or another brand, they, you have to like super glue the Velcro on yourself to use the gaiters which is not that big of a deal, but you replace, like I said, you'll replace your shoes a couple different times. I replaced my shoes six times. So it was nice to not have to think about like super gluing on the Velcro every single time. Um, and yeah, I found for me and I have like more narrow feet, the Brooks were great and um, my orthotics worked um, awesome. I really didn't have much foot pain, a little bit of plantar foot, like plantar fasciitis type pain uh, later in the trail, but really, really, really minimal, especially compared to most of the other people that I know. And as long as I was good about stretching out my feet and my calves, um, I was doing pretty good in that department, which is awesome. 
Last but not least, I have these Zero, that's the name of the brand, sandals. Um, they're very lightweight. Okay, I'm not even gonna let myself keep going on this because those shoes were actually awful. Um, they were the lightest weight version I could find online. Um, but they were so light that like when you would walk, the like foot part in the front would flop down. So you'd have to like kick your foot to get the bottom flap to stay up. If that makes sense? I hope I'm making sense. So, and then they were like just so, so, so thin that it was just, yeah, I hated them. Um, it's, there's another style from Zero Shoes that were really popular on the trail and that's what I would recommend. So I swapped those out basically as soon as I could to these guys, which I'll put the um, style down below and it was a huge difference. These are super comfortable. They are still very lightweight and thin. They're not quite as lightweight as those, but honestly it is worth the extra weight. It's like, I'd rather do this or nothing than those stupid ones. They were just like absolutely terrible if I'm being honest. So I've been racking my brain to think of if there's anything that I didn't mention in that video that I added. And there was really only a couple of small things. Um, I didn't talk about my sports bra. I wore the same sports bra actually from the beginning of trail to the end. It held up great. Um, it's the Lululemon like a cloud bra. I think it was very comfortable. It basically was like, can you give me the most comfortable sports bra that you have? And it really was. Um, but something else that I had in the like sports bra department was um, later in trail, like I think in the Sierra, I, I started, I sent myself a, a really like my lightest weight, smallest bathing suit top. And it was really nice because when we'd go swimming in the lakes, um, I wouldn't have to like hike the rest of the day in a wet sports bra or even worse is when you, when it doesn't have time to dry and in the morning you have to put on a frozen slash wet sports bra. So I like keeping my sports bra dry and using the bathing suit top. Um, again, I just feel like it's so small. It's just like not that big of a deal. And in the underwear department, I didn't mention this, but I brought five pairs of underwear. Women's underwear is just so small. You just pack it down into like nothing. And I just liked having clean underwear to put on. That was like something that felt worth it to me. Um, and then lastly, I had just like kind of a small tank top that I could wear to do laundry um, or like in town. Just honestly, like sometimes it was just way too hot. It'd be like 115 degrees. So it'd be like way too hot to wear your rain, rain gear and there'd be no air conditioning or anywhere to go. So it was just nice to have that option, um, you know, while I'm doing laundry sitting in town. And yeah, I mean, as you can hear, I'm not... I'm not the most ultralight person out there. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the greatest things uh, about this adventure is you can really personalize it. So you may have been watching this and been like, you know, maybe shocked by how much extra stuff I brought compared to other people's videos that you watch on here, especially if you watch a lot of like people with these uber light base weights. Um, and that's cool. I'm celebrating them. That sounds like for me, if it were a shorter backpacking trip um, or like, you know, a one one stretch trip, I probably could have gotten away with a lot less luxury. But being out there for five months, like I liked to have a little bit more of those comforts. And, you know, I liked to have camp shoes to wear in town so I didn't have to always wear my tennis shoes and everything like that. And in the end, it really worked well for me. So, um, yeah, that was a full synopsis of, <laughs> you know, everything I brought on trail and kind of a breakdown of how things went, what I kept, what I didn't keep. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave them down below in the comments. I'll try my best to come through and answer any questions that you might have. And I am in the process of filming a few different other educational videos like this, um, you know, specifically on Q&A covering logistics and planning, personal questions, finances, things of that nature. So um, look forward to that in the coming weeks. And as always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can be here for all of the next videos that come along PCT related and then all of the future adventures from here to come. All right, that's it for me this week. See you next Sunday. Yeah.